Praise the Lord. We can find our seats. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for being here at Wellspring. Thanks for those good testimonies. How am I doing? Is my mic a little bit hot or is it okay? A little loud? I don't know. Whatever you guys think back there. Hey, we, uh, as you just heard from those two great testimonies, that uh, community is a big deal at Wellspring Worship Center and trying to connect. In fact, in the Bible, there's a lot of analogies and metaphors. And so we're going to talk about this. Did you know the reason you're on the planet uh, isn't merely to acquire stuff or to merely accomplish a goal in your life? When you reach the end of your life and you're dying in your deathbed and you're laying there at 95 years old or whatever, it's not the stuff that you've acquired in life and it's not the accomplishes that you've kind of made or achieved that are going to be the primary measurement of how life went for you and how well it went. If you're filled with delight, hopefully you will be, or if you're filled with regret, chances are pretty high that it's going to be about relationships and people in your life, not about the things you've achieved and whatnot. And, and you might say, well, why is that? And the reason is because God himself is intrinsically communal. He is a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit. And uh, we are made in his image, and so we have that same DNA on the inside. And so we're going to be talking about this today. You know, there's a danger in isolation, and there's a great blessing in connection and community. Hallelujah. That's what we have this Connect Group Fair out there and ministry fair uh, outside going on. Hey, if you're not in a group, we want you to get in a group. If you are in a group, we want you to just re-sign up. Hallelujah, because it's powerful. We've seen many people find their place of community at Wellspring through our connect groups. Thank you, Jesus. So the message today, we're talking about the benefits of community and the dangers of isolation. Does that sound all right? Come on, it's going to be good, I'm telling you up front. Praise the Lord. Uh, hey, God has hardwired people to be interconnected. Not, not like codependent people, but interdependent people. And when I'm weak, someone else is strong. When someone else is uh, strong, uh, I can gain from that. And when I'm strong and they're weak, vice versa. And so we can all learn something in this and get connected in this. Because here's one of the things I've learned over the years is that we all have experienced some kind of isolation living in New England or some kind of loneliness. And whether you're a junior high or high schooler or just went downstairs or a college student or you've lived a while, you actually don't have to live very long to experience isolation in life. And it can perpetuate for weeks or months or even years. And maybe some of us know people in this room who've lived in isolation for like decades. And it's devastating emotionally. It's devastating physically. It's devastating spiritually. And the reason it's devastating is because it's never been God's design for our lives to be isolated, but to be connected. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. Let me read one verse from uh, second, or a couple of verses from Second Corinthians. I think it's chapter 7 here. Paul's in trouble, uh, he's down and out, and it says this, that uh, when we came to Macedonia, uh, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside and then fears on the inside. Uh, but God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by, and normally I would expect the next phrase to be something like, the presence of the Lord, or the Holy Spirit came or some angel came and comforted. Or we read a word of encouragement from Scripture and it became alive to us. But it doesn't say any of those things. It says, God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of one of their friends. Titus knocks on the door. He says, hey guys, how you all doing? I, I heard maybe uh, things aren't going so well. I've just been thinking about you. What's going on? And Paul recognized and was spiritually enough, uh, mature enough to realize this is like God coming to us in the form of Titus. Like he's pouring out grace and comfort to us just through this other person. I mean, you know, we need people in our lives to strengthen us and encourage us and be with us. Hallelujah. Let me just pray for us as we get started here. Father, thank you so much for the community in this church and the community that's growing. And would you use the next 20 or 25 minutes of my voice, Lord, to, to help encourage us to get more plugged in, not less plugged in, more plugged in with you and more plugged in with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. How many know that the last words, thinking of 
you're going to die someday. It's kind of morbid to think that through on Sunday morning. But you're going to die someday. And um, how many of you know the last words can be pretty significant in life, what people say? So if you look this up online, famous last words. I did that last night. And so I'm just going to bring up a few here because I'm going to look at the last words of Jesus here in a minute. But before we get to Jesus, let me just give you a, a few others that might be sobering or desperate maybe or comical or whatever. But um, here's a few of them here. This guy, Cicero, lived back when Nero, not Nero Caesar, uh, Caesar, the first Caesar, back in like 40 BC, he's getting murdered. And while he's getting murdered, he says this, there is nothing proper about what you're doing, soldier. And then he says, but at least try to kill me properly. Oh my gosh. Whatever. Here's King Louis XIV. He was the, uh, how many remember, knew that um, Queen Elizabeth of England had the longest reign in England and she died at seven, from, after 70 years or something like that? Well, this guy holds the record for the longest reign of any known king where we can trace the dates back, 72 years. So he was the greatest king in France from like 1650 to 1730 or something. Anyway, um, he survived like three deadly diseases and didn't die. So they sort of thought like maybe he's going to live forever. But as he's dying, his last words are, why are you weeping? Did you imagine I was immortal? Hmm. Who knows Nathan Hale? 21-year-old dude? Oh, my gosh. In New York City, he gets hanged because he's working for the American Revolution, and the British find out he's a spy for the American Revolution. He went to Yale and graduated from Yale, I guess, at 21. And uh, who knows his famous last words? Here it is. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I wasn't talking to you, Virginia. Uh, that guy, what a hero, though. Are you, I mean, that is just an incredible statement. Last words. Here's the last one. Conrad Hilton became a billionaire because of um, uh, the hotel industry, and his last words uh, were this. Please leave the shower curtain on the inside of the tub. <laughs> That's true. That's a true story. He kicked into autopilot mode. He must have said that a million times in his life, and it just sort of came out. Well, let's look at Jesus' last words for, for a moment or two here. His final instructions from Acts chapter 1. He's talking to his disciples, and they're gathered together, and he says, Hey, guys, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that the Father promised. We talked about this last week, the day of Pentecost, which you've heard me speak about. And so before Jesus ascends into heaven, he tells the, the uh, disciples there, guys, stay here in Jerusalem, stay and pray, stay together, be together. And 10 days later, 120 of them are in this upper room. And as they're praying together, here are the results that happened from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Can we just read that line again? They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and they filled the whole house where they were seated and sitting. So coming together in one place, how many, maybe that has an effect on things, being unified. I just want to point that out, that the word community, the second half of the word, I'm just going to capitalize and say unity within that community. But here's my first point. Uh, community where there's unity encourages the power and presence of God to be released. Come on. That's just where it's at. You're kind of going your own thing, doing your own, not plugged in, not connected. You're not going to experience the power and presence of God like you can when we gather together. Hallelujah. Here's another uh, last word of Jesus. Uh, before he went to the cross, he hung out with his disciples celebrating the Passover. They're uh, wrapping some things up, and he begins to pray for the disciples. And he says this in John 17. I am praying not only for these disciples but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. How many of you know that's you and me? Praise the Lord. Uh, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and are in me and I am in you. And then he says this in verse 23. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. I'm going to highlight this part. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. If you think about that highlighted phrase for a minute, Jesus is saying the evidence that Jesus is God, the evidence that the Father so loved the world that he sent his son to the world is actually the unity of the Christian church. He said to Christians, come together, stay together, pray together, be united, and that'll be the evidence to a dying world that I am who I said I am. Maybe unity is a little more important than we thought. Maybe community and staying connected is more important than we thought. 
Because God's design for church is unity and community and being together. And that's why the primary work of the enemy is to divide us and push us into isolation and get us out of community. And if you've ever suffered from isolation or suffered from depression to the point where, you know what, I don't want to be around people, I don't want to talk to people, it's actually like really demonic. It's just being pushed out into a place where you don't want to connect and God designed you to be in community. Let's not let ourselves get sucked into isolation. Thank you, Lord. So community allows the world to actually see who Jesus is. That's kind of a big deal. You know, um, it's easy to get mad in church. We've been around a little while and people get offended and they're like, hey, I don't like what they're teaching. Uh, I don't like this or like that. And there's a lot of reasons why people might leave a church. But let me give you the number one reason. Division takes place maybe through an offense or something along those lines. And the enemy sort of works that out and he divides the people of God. Let's be intentional at Wellspring of connecting and um, being in community because it allows the world to see who Jesus really is. Thank you, Lord. Here's the third point. Um, I'm going to read from Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. That's a good line. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. So that anointing oil, when they would anoint a priest to become the new priest, they would anoint him and this oil would be flowing down. And it's talking about unity. And it's like unity is like the dew of Hermon that's fallen on Mount Zion. And, and for there, where's the there? The there is in the place of unity. For in the place of unity, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So let me just highlight these, these three here, bringing God's commanded blessing in our life, community does. But look at these three. So when we're in community, it encourages the power and presence of God to be released. That's a fairly big deal. It allows the world to see who Jesus is. That's a fairly big deal. And it brings God's commanded blessing in our lives. Oh my goodness, why wouldn't we always stay connected and want to be in community if that's the outcome? Well, why are we so tempted to sort of, you know, not connect? Why aren't we more intentional? Why do we sort of push back on joining the connect group and be like, you know what, I don't really want to connect in that way. Tell you what, I've been a pastor for a little bit and these are some of the comments I hear. You know, Pastor Craig, I love Jesus. I love the church. The people are hard to deal with. Are you kidding? You know, they say statements like this. Pastor Craig, connect groups are a great idea on paper. But when you really get there and attend, you know, conceptually it makes a lot of sense. But practically, I just don't like being around people. I just don't feel like I'm compatible with people. Well, let me fill you on a little bit of secret here. Coming from uh, Tim Keller, who's one of the great pastors and authors. He passed away a couple weeks ago. But uh, in his book on marriage, he wrote this statement. uh, No two people on earth are compatible. It is simply an issue of varying degrees of incompatibility. There's a lot of wisdom in that statement right there. Come on. That's why it's so tough to be around people because that's a true statement. And let me just explain. Maybe you're engaged here today or you just fell in love. And, you know, when you first fall in love, it's sort of like we're soulmates. Oh, my gosh. We were made for each other. When we order dinner, we order the same thing off the menu. Uh, He finishes my sentences. We have the same favorite music. And on and on and on. We're like the same person. And then you get married, and things tend to shift a little bit. And there's this adjustment of incompatibility, and you realize, this person is actually nothing like me. How could this happen? I'm just going to speak the truth here for a few minutes here this morning about this. Uh, I'm going to put this phrase back up on the screen, varying degrees of incompatibility. I'm just going to say something about my wife, Karen. She's the best ever. (laughs) Fell in love with her. Come on. Uh, what year is it, honey? Maybe 1987. Fell in love. She's super beautiful. She really loves God. And I'm like, she would make a really good wife. We, we are super compatible. And you get married and you realize like a little while later, dang, we're actually not that compatible. What happened? And I'm just going to be a little transparent. We've been married for 35 years. We're working it out. We have a great marriage. We're f- totally in love. She told me last week she thinks it's going to work out. So that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But here's some of our differences. Here's some of our incompatibilities. When she watches something on TV, she likes it really like turned down low. 
Like, I'm straining to hear it. I'm like, I don't want to, st- I, I strain at a lot of things in life. I don't want to strain on hearing the TV. So can you please turn it up? And so if you come into our house, we're watching a show, and she turned it on, you might hear me saying, T- turn up the TV. We're just incompatible in that way. And speaking of that, whatever's on the TV, she would like to watch a nice drama or maybe a romance comedy along those lines. I would like to watch an action science fiction or star, or maybe some spy movie or maybe just even the news. But um, Karen is not into those things. We're in- incompatible in that area. Here's another area. If you don't know this about Karen, she's super clean, like a clean freak. Um, which I totally love and respect. Our house is really nice. She keeps it really nice. After dinner, when dinner's over, uh, every dish has to go in the dishwasher. Come on. I heard it. Come on. Hey, right here. Praise the Lord. Counters have to be wiped. Floors have to be swept. That's just how it is. I love, I love it. I'm maybe not quite as clean as that, but... It, you know, I, sometimes at night I hesitate to go to the bathroom because uh, for fear that when I return to the bed, my half of the bed will be made and the <laughs> pillows will, the decorative pillows will be back in place. That's how bad it's gotten. <laughs> that might be an exaggeration a little bit. On the other hand, I, this is what I like to do. I like when things are really accessible. And so clothes need, can't be in a drawer if they need to be accessible. Maybe it's a little bit messy, but uh, like my winter coat, I like to leave on a chair near the front door because it's the last thing I take off. It's the first thing I need in the morning. And sometimes I'm like, Karen, you're going to bed now. I'm gonna put the coat on there. You'll never see it because I'm leaving in the morning. But she's like, oh, no, no, no. Coats go in the closet. That's where they belong. Sometimes I will uh, hide an article of clothing in a strategic place when I need it. And this is what happens. She finds it, she confiscates it, she washes it, folds it, sticks it in a drawer that I don't know where it is, I never find it, and it's like gone. We're incompatible, come on. But we've been working on that incompatibility, like I said, 35 years, when we appreciate each other's differences, by maybe a little bit of messiness, her incredible cleanliness. But you know, when you, when you walk in community with people, there's things to work out in being incompatible. Come on. But let me tell you this. It's worth the stretching. It's worth the investment. It's worth getting to know someone. It's worth dealing with the little idiosyncrasies. How do you say that word? Idiosyncrasies. Come on. If you want to have a relationship, that's where it's at. And so all those incompatibilities, when you join a group, when you connect with other people, it's gonna, you're going to be stretched, but you're going to grow in God. Hallelujah. Let me make this statement here. Relationships help determine your destiny. Maybe you know this, maybe not. But um, if you find a life that's really broken and fallen apart, and uh, maybe they're stuck in poverty or some really bad things have taken place, you can usually trace that back to relationships. Relationships that didn't work or the wrong ones. I don't know if anyone in this room has ever gone into a wrong business with the wrong people and you lost a ton of money. It's just painful. Or people who've been through divorce because maybe they just married the wrong person. It's really painful. Or maybe people dating here today where the relationship they're in is pulling them away from the Lord instead of pushing them closer to the Lord. Relationships determine our destiny. Hallelujah. Many times success, I think, just falls into these three areas. Being with the right people at the right time in the right place. And God's concerned about those things, and he's concerned about the details in our life. But if I'm consistently in the wrong place, uh, at the wrong time, connecting with the wrong people, instead of connecting with the people God has for me, uh, I'm probably going to be affected. My destiny is going to be affected if I'm living in that place. Hallelujah. How about this question? What happens if I don't commit to community? You know, there's a bunch of what-ifs like that in the Scriptures. We could ask a question like this. What happens if Ruth doesn't stay with Naomi. And she just goes back to Moab and never meets Boaz and never becomes the great-grandmother of King David. What happens if Paul doesn't ever connect with Timothy or Timothy doesn't decide to go on that missionary journey? You know, we're gonna miss books out of the Bible that Paul wrote to Timothy. Uh, What happens if Zacchaeus never comes out of the tree to have dinner with Jesus? He doesn't get saved, doesn't get free and delivered. What happens if Elisha doesn't follow Elijah after he throws his mantle over his shoulder? major changes to the nation of Israel. What happens if Joseph, when he's in prison, says, 
I'm in prison for the wrong things and I've got a chip on my shoulder and I'm not going to connect with these other prisoners who have these dreams that I have to interpret. If he would have gone that route, he would have never gotten out of prison. He would have never met with Pharaoh and stepped into his destiny. There are major consequences to not committing to community connections. Hallelujah. Here's another one. How about Samson? What if Samson would have found a local girl instead of going after Delilah? Come on. He could have seen a lot better in his future. Folks, that was actually a joke. Because what happened was <laughs> Samson became blind after he was with Delilah, and I said he could have seen a better future. I think like one of you got that joke. <laughs> that is sad for church humor. Whatever. Okay. Uh, how about this verse from Proverbs 18.1? One who isolates himself, oh my gosh, pursues selfish desires, he rebels against all sound wisdom. Did you know if you have a life of isolation, the scripture says it's, the root of that is selfishness. You're pursuing selfish things in your heart. When you become the center, maybe it's all the woundedness, maybe there's bad things that happened. Listen, if you've gone through bad church experiences, the antidote to a bad church experience is not isolation. It's getting a good church experience. Praise the Lord. Wellspring is going to try super hard to give you a good church experience. But when I'm the center of my world and everything's about me and it revolves around me and, and am I getting fed in this place? And do they have a ministry especially for me? Is that what's going on? Listen, God wants to minister to you, of course, but it certainly isn't all about you and you're not the center. In fact, I like the saying that says, we're number three. Jesus is number one. My neighbor is number two, but I'm actually number three. And if it's all about me and my business and my fame and my followers and my brand and whatever, listen, it's all then about selfish desires and that's not where it's at. Let's say amen to that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so um, in the last few minutes here, I'm gonna give you quickly four things that will speak to this issue in our life, the issue of, you know what, how do I live in community and connection when I'm always having trouble with people or problems with people? And I think these four things are gonna help you. So here's the, here are the four. Let's be willing to make space for people's stuff. Can we just read that? Make space for people's stuff. When you join a connect group, when you join a ministry team, this is what you find out. Wow, people have some stuff in their life. There's some immaturity over here. There's some social awkwardness over here. This guy's got a horrible attitude. This lady's got some bad theology. This is going on here, whatever. Let me just tell you this. When you join a connect group or a ministry team, in every group, there'll be people who give you grace and there'll be people who help you grow in grace. There's both sides. of People who will extend grace to you and people who will require you to grow in that grace. And when we understand that and recognize it, we can do what it says here in Colossians 3, make allowance for each other's faults. That's a powerful word right there. You can get that memorized in your scripture memorization. Everybody in this room, everybody on the live stream going on, all of God's children have some faults, some hangups, some weirdness, some bad attitudes, some maybe off theology along the way. But, but here's the deal. God says, hey, make allowance for it and make space for it. And you might say, why do that? Because I actually grow in grace when I make space for someone else's immaturity and they grow in grace when they sp make space for mine. Make allowance for each other's faults. And you know what? It doesn't happen if we're in isolation. If we're resisting the opportunity to connect in connect groups, you're not going to have the opportunity to grow in that grace. Hallelujah. I like this quote here. Speaking of getting along with people and being able to connect, the Carnegie Technological Institute has stated that 90% of all people who fail in their life's vocation fail because they cannot get along with people. 90%. People, are, there are going to be opportunities to extend grace, have grace, work through things. Let's not fail our life calling just because we try to isolate and can't get along with people. Thank you, Jesus. So here are four things. Let's be willing to make space for people's stuff. Here's number two. Let's be willing to not pick up an offense. Oh my gosh, the number one, I said this earlier, the number one reason people leave church is not bad preaching, it's not bad worship music, it's not that you didn't get a parking space right up in front here, it's that uh, there are unresolved offenses that take place. 
and something went wrong. Maybe the pastor didn't recognize you. Uh, maybe a leader spoke about you in a way that you didn't appreciate, or maybe something worked out the way you didn't think or whatever, and it's so easy to pick up an offense in that situation. It's like sitting there on the ground, and you go to grab it, and it like, it's like a trap that grabs hold of you, and you carry it around. And sometimes people say, well, I'm, I'm mature. I can just work through the offense myself and never really deal with it. But this is what you find in life. Undealt offense is like a seed that gets planted on the inside. And it will grow and germinate. And it'll create bitterness. And it, it, we've lived on the planet long enough, and many of us have, to see how that works out. That when we don't deal with some of those things going on, when we, don't, uh, when we uh, pick up an offense and let it work through, it actually separates us from community. Wow. And uh, I've been in ministry. If you, when I first got saved, I was our high school youth leader. And so for 40 years, you might say, I've been doing some kind of ministry. And um, one of the things that has served me really well um, is not my charisma and my good looks. Because I'm actually not that charismatic. And uh, Karen says I look good, but I don't know. But um, I know maybe you assume that's what it was, but it wasn't. This is one of the things that has served me well is learning how to deal with some difficult people and keeping a short list of offenses. You will go far in life if you just keep a short list of offenses. I can tell you that I'm not offended with anybody in this room. And neither in the first service. In fact, I actually can't, th it's hard for me to come up with somebody in this world that I'm offended with. Because I just try to let that thing go. But there's probably people uh, in both services who have some offenses against me. And maybe we haven't talked it through or walked it out and... You know, maybe if I offered that, it'd be like a long line of people, like the DMV, and you'd take a ticket and wait for your number to be called. So we're not going to do that today. But if you have some issues, we can just, we can find a time and try to work through them and pray through them. And uh, it's interesting to look at the rest of this verse that we just read. Make allowance for each other's faults. It goes on to say this, and forgive one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. I just want to highlight that, just as the Lord forgave you. It makes you want to ask the question, how did the Lord forgive you? Well, let me tell you how he did. He didn't keep a record of your past. He didn't hold it over you. He didn't keep track of how many forgiveness slots and punches there are on the card. He just kept forgiving graciously no matter what. I guess we're just supposed to be like that. That's one of the ways we operate with one another and stay in community by not picking up an offense and forgiving. Number three, let's be willing to be sharpened by other people. You know, many times the friction that we feel in life, we think it's a horrible thing. It actually makes us more effective, that friction. In connection and community, you actually get sharper because of the friction by other people. You know, when you sharpen a blade, you're going to chop down a tree with an axe, maybe, or whatever. It, you, you actually remove part of that blade by sharpening. Some of the hard things, hard material that doesn't belong there, you remove it. And uh, have you ever heard the statement, you know, that person just rubs me, rubs me the wrong way. That guy just rubs me the wrong way. She rubs me the wrong way, whatever. That's actually what sharpening is. The best, you, don't, you shouldn't avoid every situation like that, especially in church, because the friction of confrontation actually improves your life by removing things that you don't need, things that need to be sharpened. Maybe you're predicting, I'm going to put this verse up if you're a Proverbs person, but Proverbs 21 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And maybe you've got some cynicism or some critical attitudes going on, like all of us might have, some habits, some bad uh, ways of thinking. You need your blade sharpened, and other people are really good at that. Let me just give you this. Never be the kind of person that when someone confronts you or someone says, hey, can I address something in your life, where you immediately push back and say, I'm not going to that group again. I'm just checking out. Don't be that kind of person, because you can be sharpened actually by going through that process. You know, we've got people leave Wellspring over the years. You know, if God calls you to another church, we are 100% for that. But if God, if you're feeling like, I'm just offended, so I'm leaving and never going back to any church, uh, we, we want to convince you not to do that. But there's been people who've been a part of Wellspring for many years, uh, like what's preached, like what's been part of worship and whatever, and then uh, I preach one message that they don't agree with, and they kind of check out and leave. And I'm like, you know what? Community and connection doesn't work like that. 
That, that's not how it works. Here's the deal. If I'm preaching something that's a little bit off or maybe not quite sound doctrine, we have a bunch of smart people in this room and very mature Christians and some people with divinity degrees and some people with Bible school degrees and, and they would be quick to say, hey, Pastor Craig, maybe we could rethink some of that. And so I'm actually accountable to those people and I'm willing to be sharpened by other people. Are you willing to be sharpened? It's a little bit quiet in here. Maybe we can get the keyboardist. Come on up here. Victor. Hey, Victor's doing some keyboards today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So um, that's number three. Let's be willing to be sharpened by others. Here's the last one. Let's be willing to make a commitment to community. Hallelujah. So we're asking you, at the end of this message, in the lobby, there's a lot of tables with different ministries, with different connect groups to sign up and serve. Let me tell you, belonging somewhere is actually a choice that you make. And when you make this choice and say, you know, what, I'm going to be a part of this church and I'm going to, I'm going to jump in. You'll find something kind of magical happens. When you make that commitment, you'll actually begin and begin to serve and whatnot as best you can do or whatever. You, you'll find just this acceptance. You'll find this just, I'm meeting new people. I'm connecting with people. This is amazing. And unfortunately, the opposite's true. You can disconnect from a church long before you stop going. You know, it's a sad kind of progression to see what happens, but people disconnect emotionally. Then they disconnect mentally. Uh, then they disconnect relationally and don't hang out. Then somewhere along they disconnect financially. And the last thing you see is we just don't see them anymore. And let's just recognize what that is. That is the enemy just wanting to divide and wanting to sow things in our life. God wants you connecting and in community. Praise the Lord. Planted in the house of God, the scripture says, so that you can flourish. Hallelujah. Let me just say this last thing regarding incompatibility. Listen, it's totally worth it. It's totally worth it. We've been married for 35 years. It's been totally worth it. If, if you interview Karen after this message, see if she feels the same way. I told her to say it's worth it. <laughs> Come on. I'm just going to say regarding being a part of church, it's worth it. Regarding being a part of a connect group, it's worth it. Staying in something until God releases you is worth it. The world says the opposite, but the church says, no, 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 we're staying together in community. We're running toward community and connecting with people. Hallelujah. Let's give you bow your heads with me here. We're going to pray. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you, Father, that you've called us into community. We might not do it perfectly. We might get offended and we might have issues with people and along those lines, but we're going to still go at it, Lord. We're going to still walk into community. We're going to declare it's worth it anyway. In those hard times, we're going to show grace. We're going to receive grace. We're going to be sharpened. But Lord, we're not going to withdraw and we're not going to isolate. And I just pray that anointing over every person in this room, wanting to connect with people. Lord, we break off a spirit of isolationism. You know, certain personality styles are more connecting than others, but Lord, you want all of us to connect in the way that makes sense for us, in the way that honors you. Hallelujah. So Lord, we pray as, as we close the service and people even go out there in the lobby, that there would be a heart and a desire to be connected, be available, sit in a room where we can speak into other people's lives and we give them permission to speak into our lives. We pray for one another. We stand with one another. We, we, we do things together with one another all to honor you, Lord, and to grow in our love and faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.